Welcome to day three. Uh, I'm glad you're still here for bioinformatics. If anyone is in the room for something other than bioinformatics, well, <laughs> okay, I'm glad you're here. So uh, today we are going to uh, take a shot at looking at databases. Databases are probably the, about the most underused class of software on your computer. Um, I think most people in biology at some point have opened up Excel and plunked around it with a few formulas or added some, some data, ta data to a table. But how many of us have ever opened up Microsoft Access, which is quite typically installed along with the rest of Microsoft Office? Access is a relational database that is very valuable for an awful lot of purposes. And so today, we're going to try to look under the hood a little bit and understand what those are for. Now, along the way, uh, we're going to have a taxonomy of some of the different file formats that have been used for different kinds of data sets in the context of genomics. Uh, so we'll be uh, taking a step into that. But when we wrap up uh, today, we're really going to be thinking not just about the relatively small databases that we can all produce on our, our local computers, but rather think about the really large repositories, the big volumes of data that have been stored in repositories by major institutions like the National Institutes of Health in the United States. So uh, we will we'll move ahead through that and try to, to get there bit by bit. Now, I'm going to start with something most of you may never have heard of, but that you've you've assuredly used. If you've spent any amount of time uh, working on uh, assembling a shopping cart, uh, take a lot and, and uh, uh, placing your order, if you've ever uh, spent time on a Doodle saying, yes, I could take part in a meeting at this time, almost all of these programs end up communicating information among different applications on the web. And most frequently, the way that they do that is through something called JSON. I, I tend to call it JSON, but that's because I'm a little old school, but all right, so JSON is a way to represent complex data structures in text. Now, you've all been part of our, uh, our, our tutorial as well, and you probably remember yesterday we were spending a lot of time talking about TSV and CSV files. So those are text files. It's another way to represent information. But in, in the case of TSV and CSV files, you're almost always working with a static table. You know, you have some number of columns, you have some number of rows, and you're just creating a file format that can store that. JSON gives us considerably more flexibility in what kinds of data we can represent. No problem. Uh, my vocal cords are just drowning right out. I don't know what it is. But JSON is really powerful. So in, in this case, I, I want to show that we are creating an array of objects. So it's going to be reporting uh, pair, uh, in this case, pairs of, of information fields that belong together, and it's going to give us some arbitrary number of them. Now, you can see that in, in JSON, we've got this mix of square brackets, the, the hard square brackets, and curly braces. The curly braces here are helping us to keep track of where we are in this data structure. So when you look at something like Drupal, down at the bottom, Drupal is it one of the content management systems in, uh, in this uh, in this, this collection of information, we see that there are orange curly braces around it. Those, those two go together. Uh, so having matched braces in this case is telling us which parts of this are, um, are uh, components, connect, uh, connect components. So we have uh, a name and value pair. This is something that shows up all over the place in these file formats. So we have for each of the content management systems defined by this file, we have a name, in this case, Drupal. That's a string, obviously, a character string. We have a percent market share, and then we have a, a value associated with that. So you can think, then, of JSON as a, a way of naming particular fields, of having a way to compartmentalize information. So here, this file says, what comes next is a bunch of content management systems. The, we've got the colon and square brackets to say this is the start of the, that list that I promised you. We have the green curly braces enclosing the WordPress element. We have the purple curly braces enclosing the Joomla element. And we've got the orange curly braces en encompassing the Drupal unit. So this is a very simple file structure. Obviously, we just have three content management systems and three numbers. How would you do this if you were doing a tab delimited file or a tab separated file? I think the obvious thing to do would be to call the file 
content management systems.tsv, for example. And then I might have my first column be WordPress, Joomla, and Drupal. And maybe the first line of the file would say uh, name and percent market share. And then I would have my columns underneath that. It's another way of representing this. But think about it. In, in the case of this JSON format, I might start with a series of content management systems and then go on to list another block of information. And I, because this is JSON, you can, you can string it out to add all kinds of different data structures all after each other. So while tab-separated values are good when you have a single table that you're trying to communicate to somebody via text, if you have a complex data structure or an arbitrary data structure, um, something like JSON can actually be quite handy. The next thing I would point out is that this is pretty lightweight. How much wasted space do we have here? It, first off, is this bigger or smaller than the TSV file that we might create to represent the same information? It's a little bit bigger. If I made a TSV file and I had a header row, I would have the words name and percent market share showing up just once in the top row. And then underneath that, I would just be able to put the data uh, beneath it. And we would know whether this uh, datum represented a name or a percent market share, depending on whether it was in the left column or the right column. Is that, is that much straightforward? So there's a little bit of waste here that we have labels getting repeated throughout the file. But that's, one, that's part of the price that we would pay for the much greater extensibility of a format like JSON. So uh, JSON's been around for forever and a day. Uh, has anyone today heard of Netscape? Wow, OK. Yes, time has changed. Well, back in the day, uh, the first uh, web browser that people really adopted in droves was the Netscape web browser. And Microsoft entered the fray with Internet Explorer, and everything kind of went kaflooey for a while. So um, back in the late 1990s, Netscape was just this uh, amazingly important tool. Um, so part of what made Net uh, Netscape so powerful was that it had the ability to deal with JavaScript code. So it could execute software on the web page that was written in this JavaScript language. So the JavaScript object notation is what gave us the name JSON to begin with. Now, this, this web browser has long since been defunct, and yet the, this name JSON has lingered because it beca it's become used in so many other contexts. You see the same kind of pattern in bioinformatics all the time. Somebody will create an algorithm that, ever, that goes out of use decade, uh, you know, after a decade or so of relevance, and yet file formats that were introduced by that software tend to live on forever. Has anyone heard of the FASTA file format? FASTA, yeah, a lot of people say that too. Okay, I, again, I, my pronunciation might be a little different. Uh, so yes, FASTA is a, uh, a text file format that we use to represent biological sequences. So if you download the human proteome, for example, you're downloading all of the different protein sequences that humans can produce from our genomes. Um, so you could get that in a FASTA file format. But a lot of people have forgotten that FASTA derived from a, an, an alignment algorithm, a fast alignment algorithm. Uh, and so we, we, think of, we think of FASTA as a file format, but in fact, that it, was, it was originally the, uh, kind of one of the first major steps towards BLAST. So, just an interesting backstory. So JSON may have come from Netscape, but today lots and lots of web tools are communicating in this language behind the scenes. All right. Now, if we want to get into the uh, a much more complex format than that, uh, we would definitely need to talk about the extensible markup language. Markup languages tend to be kind of poorly understood, but I would submit that we've used them this morning. If you have downloaded a web page, you have downloaded something in a file format related to XML. Does anyone know what HTML is? Oh, good. Okay, glad. I'm, I'm glad I'm not uh, hitting empty on that one. All right. So uh, that is the hypertext markup language. It is a cousin of, H, uh, of XML. So if you have ever written HTML code by hand, you probably remember that if you wanted some text to show up in bold, you would need to have a little bracket B, uh, then the text, and then a close bracket B. That's to open, to start bolding, and to stop bolding. 
Technically, if you're creating a paragraph in the HTML, you should have a, a P element that starts it and a slash P element that stops it. Same works for italics. When you put in a hyperlink, there's an anchor element. You put, you put an A in there at the beginning that says this is the URL this part should click to. And then you have an end A element that says this is the end of the stuff that should be underlined as the hyperlink. So you, you've already experienced a markup language, a language that has these added elements of text in there to specify particular meaning. XML is very much like that, but it is not explicitly intended as something to be rendered on a web page. So if we were to look at this file format, uh, you can see that I'm going to have some additional overhead. And this very top line says, this is written to the XML spec version 1.0, uh, and it, I'm using an encoding UTF-8, which, uh, which is a uh, kind of a modern day uh, a modern day relative of ASCII. So we've we've already talked about that a couple lectures ago. In this case, I'm going to uh, open a catalog element. You see that I've got catalog without any slashes in it. That's to say, this is the start of the catalog. Anytime you open an element in XML, you better be ready to close it. And down here at the bottom, you see that there's a forward slash catalog. That is the end of the catalog element. We have within the catalog element CD elements. And we have two different blocks that are each spelled out as CDs. We have titles, artists, countries, companies, prices, and years. Uh, and that's true for both of these elements. So the, all, it might seem a little burdensome. But if we have to open catalog and close catalog, we also need to open price and close price. So we see that we have these, um, this, this structure of starting a field and stopping a field. And both of those elements include the title, or the, include the uh, type of element that we're closing off. All right. Um, so XML is very, very widely used in bioinformatics. Uh, the, the number of different file structures that you can represent uh, is incredibly flexible. But it does come at a lot of overhead cost. Again, if you were trying to create a tab-separated values uh, representation of these data points, how many rows would you probably use? Two. You'd probably use two. You, I mean, you might have a header row in there, of course. So you might have a, a header that says title, artist, country, company, price, year. And then after that, you would have one row for Cat Stevens and you'd have one row for Joe Cocker. He's the guy with a really growly voice. Everyone knows Cat Stevens? Oh. I'm just going to feel old for a moment. That's quite all right. Sang some of my first, my, my favorite songs. All right. Now, there are some really powerful things that you can do in addition to this. You might have created a schema document, or a, a, I believe it's a document type definition, um, externally that says, Anytime somebody uses the term CD, they must include these elements. So here we have a CD. So a validator, uh, an external piece of software, would be able to look at this XML document and say, is this legit or is it corrupt? You know, does it meet all of the requirements of what must be communicated? So it's a way of, of protecting the correctness of the information that's there. I am part of a group of people who create standards for how biological information should be represented um, to communicate among different software tools. And you would be astonished how much time we spend trying to figure out what is a required field, what's a recommended field, what is an optional field, right? We spend huge amounts of time on questions like this because we want to be able to reproduce analyses very readily, to have lots of different software tools for the A piece of the pipeline that can communicate interchangeably with different pieces for the B part of the pipeline. Standards are part of that. Okay, so now we've talked about JSON, we've talked about XML. You've already had some experience of comma-separated and tab-separated files. Let's now talk a little bit about how file formats end up playing into this. So we're going to start with a file format that most people kind of assume is the primary output from every sequencing experiment. The FASTQ is a file that is used to represent the sequencing reads produced by a sequencer. 
So I have submitted some sample to CPGR, they run it on their next Seq 500, and they pass back to me a FASTQ file. Because the, the next Seq 500 is a pretty, a pretty mainstream instrument at present, but I, I have to say, if you watch this video in two or three years, of course it'll be junk, it'll be yesterday's trash that we've thrown out. Sequencing technology moves incredibly quickly. So, um, what I receive back from the CPGR after they've sequenced a sample of mine is a bunch of FASTQ files. The FASTQ represents all of the sequence reads, the, the letters of sequence from each of the sequencing reads produced by the instrument. But it also includes information about base quality scores. This is something I'm going to talk about a lot more once we get to the next generation sequencing module, if you take that one. Um, so this this pile of information is pretty massive. You can fully expect each sample to yield a gigabyte, a gigabyte of data in a FASTQ file. These are big. But it's just text. It's text. You can look through the file in a text editor, if you have one that can handle a, gigabit, a gigabase size file, and see the base calls right, out, uh, right in the, the text of the, the document. Um, now, this fast cue is not actually what the instrument is observing in order to produce those sequencing reads. It's actually doing, uh, 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 it's producing these electropherograms that report patterns of intensity of light flashes that re represent the, in many cases, the incorporation of another nucleotide um, as it's doing its sequencing at millions of locations at the same time. So each of these locations is going to have its own pattern of light flashes that indicate what sequence comes there. So that's the primary data of sequencing. It, its interpretation is the FASTQ. So generally speaking, um, the, the FASTQ is actually, it, it's become such a popular file format that all of these different sequencers out there have the ability to export their sequencing experiments to it. But it is still just a really big text file. Typically they pass them around in zipped format simply because they're so large if you don't do something like that. Okay, so that's the first of the, uh, the animals at the zoo. Um, this is going to be a bit of a tour of diff different parts of things that, uh, that show up. Let's talk about the problem of alignment. Again, this is something we'll talk about much more in, ne in next-gen sequencing. But in this case, if I were to sequence uh, a biofluid from some person uh, to, to uh, measure um, the DNA of, of cells circulating in that, that biofluid, uh, it would not be the first time a human being has been sequenced, would it? We actually know a lot about our genomes. We know about which genes should be there, we know about which chromosomal segments are where, about which genes are next to each other, and so on. So it's sort of pointless for me to act as though this is a completely new, uh, a completely new organism we're looking at by a sequencer for the very first time. So most of, the, most of the time when we do a human genome, we are going to do, we're going to deal with those data by alignment. Which is to say, we're going to say that this read that has been observed maps to this location in the known human genome, and, it, and, and we can just sort of layer it right there. So we can basically throw each of these reads onto uh, this known alignment, and that mapping is the, the basis for our understanding it. Now, what happens if you have a bunch of sequences that do not correspond to the, the genome annotation. Is your first conclusion that this person has an extra chromosome that nobody's ever seen before? Probably not. More generally, you might worry that the sample you handed to the sequencer was contaminated with another species. So in a case like that, it might be that you discover that uh, this person has a bunch of virus circulating in their system or they have, uh, that, that the sample was contaminated by microbes, something like that. Okay, so this document, this alignment, is the information we want to pass to somebody. It's no longer a fast queue at this point. It's not just a, uh, a, a series of 50 nucleotides from an individual read. It's now information because it's been, um, it's been uh, organized by the use of the, the known genome annotation. So when we, uh, when we pass around a SAM or a BAM file, we are typically passing around this nexus of an annotation that's been brought to bear to understand reads. So we think of the fast Q coming in, the annotation coming in, and out pops a BAM or SAM file. Now, SAM and BAM have a very strong relationship to each other. 
Uh, when SAM was first created, sequencers kicked out rather less data than they do now, and so uh, reporting this alignment in a text format seemed to make a lot of sense to people. But more recently, uh, the, all of the tools that read and write SAM have been adapted to read and write a binary version of that file. Now, this comes at some loss. You know, if you have a text file, you can pop it open with uh, less or more on a, on a Linux system and page through it and, and look at it very quickly. But a BAM file is going to be more compact. It might, for example, have uh, compression built into it that can allow you to store the same information in a much more compact space. Just as an intellectual exercise, let's stop to think about how, um, how bogus it is to store nucleotide sequences in ASCII. This is going to relate to what we talked about two days ago, right? ASCII. So how many, how many bits are stored to represent each letter in an ASCII file. A standard text file. How many bits per character? Eight bits. Eight bits, exactly. So each byte of eight bits is, uh, has the ability to represent any of 256 different characters. Most of them are things like beep and spaces and stuff like that. But of those, uh, 52 of them are letters uppercase and lowercase. Everyone sees why those are stored differently. Okay, so if we were to store a gigabase, uh, to, to store a billion nucleotides in ASCII, we would use one byte for each letter of sequence. Does everyone see that? So A, if every time there was an A, we would write a 65, uh, a byte with a value 65 in there because that's the ASCII code for big, uh, for capital A. Every time there was a C, we would write a 67, because that's the, that's the ASCII code for capital C. But that's pretty wasteful, isn't it? Right. We don't need a full byte to represent each letter of sequence. How many nucleotides are there? Cool. Spot on. There are four nucleotides. So we need something to represent A, C, G, and T, but the rest of it we don't really care too much about. Now, I'm, I'm going to just skip right past a, 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 counter, a counter argument. Not everything we write is going to be A, C, G, and T, because sometimes we're going to have indeterminate letters. Right? We, we might know there's a nucleotide here, but we're not certain which letter it is. That could happen. But for now, let us assume that we're only going to write A's, C's, G's, and T's. How many bits do you need in order to record one of four possibilities. Two. Exactly two. Yes, you could use one bit to say this is a pyrimidine or a purine, and the other one to say which one it is, right? Okay, so you could already get a four-fold increase in how much sequence you can represent per byte just by going to a two-bit format for storing A, C's, G's, and T's. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why the num uh, a binary representation rather than a text representation tends to win as data sizes get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, now uh, sometimes people are really interested in doing visualizations. So this is a genome browser down here, uh, and we're visualizing uh, some information that we had received in bed format. That's what this uh, little gray box to the left is. So we are seeing that uh, in this case we have mappings between uh, reads that were produced in the sequencer and different locations across this genome assembly. Okay, so BED is a format that allows us to uh, store uh, this, these representations just for the purpose of visualization. So there might be quite a bit of, there might be quite a lot of ironing that goes on between the, uh, the BAM file and, uh, on route to producing a BED file. If all you care is, did I observe any reads for this location in the genome, it doesn't really matter to you whether you've got 20 reads or 1,000 that all uh, occur in this particular location. So something like a bed tends to be a much, smaller, uh, a, a much smaller export than something like a BAM file would be. There's selected information that, uh, just to support visualization. You might have said, for example, uh, show me how the reads relate to this particular gene, and anything that didn't hit that particular gene would not be exported, right? So that's a, that's a very small subset 
of the total information. All right. Now, this, it, this keeps going on. We have things like the general feature format. This is, a, I think, kind of a fascinating uh, thing to, to think about. If you have a huge pile of DNA sequence, is it the same thing as having an annotated genome? Bunch of sequence versus annotated genome. Is there a difference? OK. If you, if you find that question interesting, be sure to take the next generation sequencing class because uh, we're going to talk about that one in some detail. There's a world of difference between an assembled genome, which is to say long contigs of sequence built from these little patches of read, and an annotated genome. Because an annotated genome has things like this area right here describes a protein coding gene, and these are its exons, and this is how they stitch together in known isoforms. Right? So it's completely different. You, you need to have these, these long contiguous sequences in order to get to a genome assembly, but one is not the other. So the GFF is, it's, it's kind of like your best friend forever, actually, if, if you're going to be doing genome annotation work. The, the GFF is going to describe how the different positions within these contigs relate to features you care about. Do you want to know where the tRNAs are? The GFF has that information. Do you want to know what the, what the exonic structure of this gene would be, how many different uh, introns are, are spliced out of it, the GFF should have that information. So very useful files. Frequently, we don't care about all of that information, though, when we're trying to make an assessment for an individual sample. As I mentioned, I spent a lot of time in cancer biomarkers. And in cancer, you frequently find that the tumor has a different sequence in several places than do the rest of the cells in that person. Because cancer is very much a, a disease of mutation. It can, uh, a, a mutation that goes uncorrected can lead to cancer, which in turn creates mutations. So seeing the mutation status of all the genes in these samples, and particularly of driver genes in that sample, uh, can make a big difference in understanding whether this person will respond to a particular treatment or not. So when we, uh, when we export information about whether this person has uh, wild type or mutant alleles for these particular genes, you're likely to export it in VCF format. And VCF, like all the others, has gained its very own binary version, BCF, which sounds so much like it already that uh, uh, many languages kind of barely distinguish between these letters. So VCF is very good for detailing variations from wild type for a particular sample. All right. So we, we've gone through a bit of a zoo. Let's talk a little bit about what goes on behind the curtain at one of these major uh, repository sites. I want to point out, though, that as we talk about relational databases, we're not just talking about something that serious bioinformaticists do. Databases are usable by you. I, I would, uh, I would drag you back to the 1950s and 60s for, for just a moment, when people were asked why personal computers would be a thing. Why would a person need a computer? This is a very recent concept. Only, I mean, this is only like a 60-year-old idea, right? How long has humanity been around? A lot longer than that. So what, what would lead someone in the 1960s to believe that a, any student going to college should have a computer? A, that would have been astonishing to them. Okay, so. The, one of the first things that people talked about was, gosh, well, my wife keeps this box of cards that has all of her mama's recipes on, uh, in it. I don't mean to be sexist on this one. Men can be good cooks. I am not. Um, I'm a really lousy cook, actually. But uh, let us imagine then that a person, man or woman, young or old, has a box in his or her kitchen, uh, <laughs> and on it we have a bunch of cards, and those cards represent the family legacy. This is what we do in order to make, favorite dish? Lasagna. Lasagna. Whoa, I, I like your family a lot. <laughs> I, w I was gonna go with, uh, uh, what is it, a, a poiki pot? Uh, you know, your, your, your favorite, your favorite menu? I, I, I haven't had enough of that. That's, that's some really good stuff. <laughs> I, I'm, there's a great, a, great, uh, a great cultural legacy in South Africa in, in cooking, no questions. 
I, what, what, what else can you say about a country whose national support uh, national sport is the braai? You know, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Okay, well anyway, so the the idea in the 1960s was that people might want to store recipes, right? Maybe they would want to store some recipes. Maybe that's why every house would want a computer someday in the very distant future. We live there, right? We live in that future. And yet, we don't see a lot of people using these information systems to store things like recipes. So let us imagine, then, that we have a set of recipes, that's, each of which is going to include a, a list of ingredients. Can we agree that that's something that should show up in the recipe? Uh, it uh, probably includes uh, cooking instructions of some sort, temperatures, durations, mixers. Don't mix it too much. You know, I've learned that that really does spoil a few pots. I'm, I'm kind of the designated mixer in my kitchen. <laughs> so, um, so let us also imagine that we want to track some information about the people who gave us these recipes. Like maybe you want to keep the recipes from uh, that, that came from your friend's family separate from the ones that came to you from mama, right? So now uh, we have a complex bit of information. We have a data structure that each recipe represents, a bunch of ingredients and cooking instructions. Sometimes we have cross-references, like uh, this one says, use the cream cheese frosting defined in card, blah, blah, blah. Well, now I gotta go scrabbling around to that other card. So now we've got cross-referencing going on. And we're going to have a, 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 a mention of who provided this recipe to us. But see, all of these may require different tables. Maybe you have a bunch of hazelnuts uh, that someone has given you. They, they've run a, a, a bunch of nut trees, right? So they've, they've given you a bunch of hazelnuts. And you want to know, gosh, what recipes do I have that contain hazelnuts? So being able to perform a query across your, all of your recipes to say which are the ones that involve hazelnuts would be really useful. All right, so this is going well beyond what you can do if you're simply storing a 2D table in Excel. Do you see why, why that's true? Because we have all of these, uh, these cross-referencing of, of different tables that we need to care about. All right, so RDMSs were first defined in 1970. Now that might seem like a very long time ago. I was born three years after that, just so you know. <laughs> All right, so EFCOD put together this definition of what a relational database management system would be. Uh, RDMS is quite frequently just called databases, but that's not strictly speaking true. There are other kinds of databases out and beyond uh, relational. Uh, now, IBM was uh, a company that really invested heavily in this because they pr very much perceived their prerogative to uh, supply everything businesses would need. And who needs, who needs databases more than businesses, right? I mean, everyone here, I think, has a student number, right? Have you ever thought why the school needs to give you a number? Is a number just one of those things institutions like to produce? Well, there is sort of that institutional belief. But in fact, it's quite useful. They might want to know, uh, maybe uh, they learn that something has happened to a particular student, and they need to notify their emergency contacts right away. They have a database for that. Maybe they receive a request from a student saying, what's my transcript? Well, they're going to get information back on you based on your student number. So these, uh, so SQL and, and languages like that were designed to support the retrieval of information from RDMS systems. Uh, this SQL language, SQL, is used all over the place. Essentially, almost any database you can, you can download today will make use of SQL queries. And we'll take a look at what the, what those, uh, the query language looks like in a minute. But uh, MS Access, I think a great many of you probably already have installed on your computers. It quite frequently comes with Microsoft Office. SQL Lite tends to be a, a very lightweight uh, framework for people who are writing software that needs to make use of a database framework. MySQL and PostgreSQL uh, are very widely used open source databases. And of course, there are some monster uh, companies out there that have really specialized in databases, Oracle being one of the biggies. I, uh, I put kind of a, a, a not very interesting little icon down here in the bottom right corner, but you're frequently going to see these appearing in bio, uh, bioinformatics workflows. And I just want to point out, this is what people, uh, when people include this shape, they almost always mean a database sits here. Just a bit of shorthand. 
Okay. Now, there's quite a lot of information to cover, and a lot of this is just going to be definitional, but I, I hope that everyone will stick with me on this one. Uh, up at the top, I've, I've written a few terms that get thrown around quite frequently. We've got an attribute, uh, sometimes just called a field. This is a particular column. Um, imagine phone numbers, right? Maybe we have a, a phone number column, and each of us has a, either a mobile or an office line um, uh, spelled out in that column. That column in a table is an attribute, an attribute. Tuple is a very widely used uh, term, uh, and it refers to as essentially a row that's been abstracted out of a database. So um, if you need to add a tuple or delete a tuple or update a tuple, these uh, are referring to a particular row out of a table. And sometimes you will see that people call these a relation. That instead of calling it a table, we have a relationship between attributes and tuples, and the intersection of each is, is one of these fields. Okay, so the tuple is the row. We have these attributes within the rows, and sometimes we, we use something called a key, or a primary key in this case, uh, which is a way for us to, to know that this particular field is of particular importance, this particular attribute within this table is an important one. So a primary key is things, it would represent things like your student number. Your student number, ideally, has, has only ever been used by you. Out of all the thousands of students that have percolated through University of the Western Cape, your student number is yours alone. So if they, uh, uh, if they want to dig up information on a particular student and they know that student's number, they can pull out all records pertaining to that number very quickly because they've set that up as a primary key in some table. Okay? Uh, so you can imagine that not only is that number unique, but that the table has been sorted in such a way that it's very rapidly possible to dig out all records pertaining to any particular key. Okay. Uh, the other thing that's very useful about keys is that they facilitate joins. Joins. Okay, so let's return to the recipe book for a moment. Uh, we have a, a database built from our recipe archives. Now, I, uh, I'm going to talk about my great aunt Verna for a moment. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get choked up. I really miss her. <laughs> but great aunt Verna uh, had, we always called her Verney, what can we do, right? Um, had an amazing uh, an amazing cream cheese and cherry cheesecake. It was just astonishing, right? It had graham crackers crumbled up to be its crust. It, oh, it was so good. <laughs> I, I'm getting hungry just thinking about it right now. What if I wanted to pull out all recipes that my Aunt Verna had, uh, had contributed over her time, right? So I could... Uh, I, I would need to find the information uh, that, that uh, I would need to find the key associated with Aunt Verna in my table. And then from that, I would be able to uh, grab out all records from my recipe book table that had originator, maybe the originator attribute was my Aunt Verna, uh, her, her key number. So this join would allow us to merge information across tables in such a way that we could pull out all records over here that pertain to those over here. Let's uh, look at how that spells out. Oh, okay. So this is a messy one. Now we're doing cont uh, contact management by uh, some some in, uh, some uh, corporate thing. I, I pulled this image from softwarematters.co.uk, but it's it's just an image. This is a, a very typically used schema. A schema is typically showing how different tables, different relations relate to each other. So we see, uh, for example, well, let's, let's use this one over here. See under history ID, that very first uh, item under history, we see that hist ID has a little key beside it. And so you should think to yourself, ah, any join that involves the history ID is going to be faster because it's involving a primary key. This table's already sorted on that column. But we also see that there are fields that are shared among these different uh, tables, between, among these different relations. Contacts has a contact reference number that serves as its key. And contact ref also shows under history. So I want you to imagine um, 
a couple old dudes at lunch. It always seems to be old dudes. So a couple old dudes are at lunch. Uh, one of them hands the other his business card saying, oh yeah, yeah, you can phone me about that. Now, this contact between a salesperson and a potential client has been made, and we have this card that results from it. That card is not going to last for long, but it is going to last long enough that that information gets entered into the contact history. This salesman has contacted this person. That, the, that, that contact will be logged in such a way that we can determine how frequently we've had contact from that person in the past. Was it always in person? Was it sometimes by email? Did they phone into our customer service system? And so on. These relationships, these lines that we see among these different tables, are the ways that this uh, that you can merge information across tables meaningfully. And you should notice that on one end of these relationships we have a one, and on the other end we have uh, an infinity symbol. What that is to say is that this is a one-to-many relationship. In some cases you'll see one-to-ones, but this one-to-many relationship means that for every single staff member here, there may be multiple times that that person has been mentioned in the history database. See, because there's a one on this end and an infinity on the other end. So when you're interpreting a database schema like this, those relations uh, uh, can make it a little easier how to get from here to there. All right. I said we were going to look just a, mer a brief moment at what SQL looks like. SQL is an incredibly commonly used language for defining queries. Now, if you're making a query in Microsoft Access, do you need to know all of the SQL language in order to understand how to create a new query? No. Microsoft Access is a very friendly database, and so one of the things you could use is its query designer, a query builder, a query wizard, whatever they're calling it in this version, I don't even know. But it, it gives you the ability to say, I'm going to need these tables, and they're going to be, they'll need to be related in this way for me to ask this particular question of the database. That information all gets encoded in a SQL query like this. So here you can see that this, uh, that this select is going to create a new table that has ID, name, amount, and date. So the output from this is going to be those four fields. But it must be drawn from customers joined with orders. Customers joined with orders. So these are two different tables that we're bringing together. But as we do this join process, we have to specify how they're relating to each other. So we see that inside customers, there is a field called ID, and we're going to force it to only relate those records in which it has the, the customer's ID is the same as the orders.customer underscore ID. Now, it may be the case that this is not a one-to-one -one relationship. What if, for example, this uh, a, an individual customer ID maps to multiple uh, orders customer ID. I just placed another order with Take-A-Lot, right? Is it the first time I've ever ordered from Take-A-Lot? It is not. I've ordered a few times from Take-A-Lot. I have a bad habit, I'm afraid. So, you can, you, when I go looking through their customer order database, my customer ID maps to several entries there. So if we perform this query on the Take-A-Lot database, my ID number, my name, the uh, amount I spent with them, and on what dates I spent it is a pretty useful query to them, isn't it? Now they can say, are we making money off this Dave Tab guy or not? The answer, yes. Okay, so this, this is the, the SQL language representation of this particular query. Okay, yeah, I don't think I have more I want to say there. Which moves us, oh, sorry, this is actually a complex concept. All right, normalization. How do you know if your database design is any good or not? You know, we're so accustomed to working in Excel that we quite frequently think, well, there's got to be some two-dimensional table, some grid, that can be used to represent any experiment. <coughs> but that's not actually true. It's quite frequently the case that our study designs would be better if we could split them up into multiple tables. So, uh, imagine a, 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 an experiment where you have time courses on five different patients. You could say, this is, uh, sorry, person, person one, time point one, person one, time point two, person one, time point three, et cetera. You could do that. 
But it might be better to store the time points separately from the people, because it may be that this person's information could only be stored once rather than multiple times. So we, uh, we can imagine a database like this as kind of a problematic thing. Let's, let's imagine for a moment that this is the information that the university is using to store information on each student, right? So they've got an ID number for each student. We have a, a name for each student. Well, that's sexist. There's not a single woman there. What's wrong with me? Alex could be a woman. Alex could be a woman. That's very true. <laughs> Alexa. <laughs> so here we've got a city. This is where uh, the student lives. And we have a, a subject, right? So now we, we have this model in which we're storing in one table all the information about that student. Now, if we want to add uh, a contact phone number, we'll need to add another column in here. And if we uh, are going to store their grades, well, maybe we'll need to add in another column. You can see that this gets pretty messy and, and pretty thorny pretty fast. So let's talk about an update anomaly. Adding a record requires re-entry of extant data for consistency. Let us imagine that um, Adam has decided that he wants to study uh, biology and computer science. He's a go-getter, right? So if we're going to add another record, we're going to have to duplicate information, right? So we're going to have another line because we have another subject that this person's adding, which means that we've got to duplicate the name Adam and duplicate the name Durbinville, right? So the, the location uh, Durbinville. So this updating gets problematic. If you haven't created a database uh, structure that's responsive to what you're trying to do, update anomalies are one possible outcome. Next, insertion anomaly. We may not have all the fields we need when adding a record. What happens if a new student enrolls? Make it a Bongani, perhaps? We'll make it Bongani. So Bongani joins us. Student uh, number 405 is added. But Bongani is really new here, and Bongani has not decided what subject uh, he or she is going to study. So that's, uh, that's problematic. We may insert a record but have to leave a field blank because we don't have that information yet. And deletion anomaly. What happens if, uh, to return to Adam, let's say Adam decides to drop the biology major but hasn't picked a new one yet. Well, we, we would like to delete this information, but if we delete this whole record, we lose all of the information on Adam. So we use this, this uh, practice of normalization as a way to help us design databases in a way that they can grow and shrink without, without having these kinds of problems result. Normalization can be a very complex topic, but all of it relates to problems of this, of this type. Okay. So we're going to move through some repositories. I'm going to try to take my time here. It, it's, it's, always it, it's always possible for me to just linger too long on something, but if, if I'm uh, giving you new information, I definitely want to retain that. I remember yesterday, s several folks were actually having a, a lot of trouble keeping up with me on the tutorial because they were typing things and running into errors and stuff like that. Always feel free to stop me for a question. Does anyone want to stop and talk about re uh, relational databases before we move ahead? Okay. So let us start with sequence database repositories. These things are massive. Almost every, essentially every published sequencing experiment ends up with data going into one of these repositories. It's more or less a requirement of publishing new genomic data. So GenBank, the European Nucleotide, uh, Nucleotide Archive, and the DNA Databank of Japan have this standing agreement that anytime someone adds a, a new entry, a new genome, or a new uh, transcriptome uh, to one of those repositories, it is automatically uploaded to the others as well. So if you happen to be in Japan, you don't have to send across to the United States to download sequences. You know all of them have already been synchronized at the DNA Data Bank of Japan. Now, I, I would note that those are located in North America, Europe, and Japan, in East Asia. Uh, so that doesn't help us a lot, does it? Do you know how, uh, how, you, we, get, uh, how we would download information from NIH in the United States? Almost all internet traffic to South Africa uh, is coming through overseas cables. And in almost every case, the overseas, uh, the overseas cable for getting data from NIH is going to pass to the UK or, uh, or mainland Europe and then across the Atlantic Ocean. 
So every bit of network traffic that goes between you and the NIH is, uh, is, is hitting this kind of um, this bottleneck of going through Europe. So it's just one of the disadvantages of being um, relatively far from where these repositories are kept. Okay, so the European Molecular Biology Lab, EMBL, uh, also runs this European nucleotide, uh, nucleotide archive. All the information NIH has in GenBank is just as accessible from EMBL. So that's very helpful to know. I did a quick look at the taxonomic divisions of GenBank using this very fresh paper, actually, uh, from 2019. And it was interesting to see just how much stuff uh, we get from bacteria. Now, we see other mammals here is listed separately from rodents is listed separately from primates. Uh, and, and it might cause you to think, well, gosh, there's not nearly as much mammalian stuff as there is bacterial. But if you look at individual species, you will see that the number of base pairs recorded for Homo sapiens is truly massive. Um, so that's 19 gigabases, I believe. How big is a human genome? Trivia question for the day. What's that? Three, I mean, three times ten to the eighth. Nine. Nine. Three times ten to the ninth. Yeah. So three gigabases is uh, the human genome. That takes us out to here. So we are redundantly collecting a lot of extra information. Um, we have uh, piles and piles of sequences that represent variants uh, that have been observed just once in the wild. Um, some of uh, the, uh, the wild type sequence for Homo sapiens is a relatively small part of all of the data we've collected for Homo sapiens. Cool. So GenBank is massive, and you can get any sequence that you want. Are you limited to looking for DNA in GenBank? No. No, you certainly aren't. Transcript information can be found there. Protein sequence information can be found there. I use the, uh, the RefSeq repository at NCBI all the time. It's an incredible, I'm sorry, uh, N NCBI is the National Center for Biotechnology Information. It's part of the National Library of Medicine, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. So NCBI has a huge number of databases that are absurdly useful. Okay, so, yes? On your point that you made about the traffic in recently in Southern Africa, yes. um, I can't remember who told us last year about that. It was they were like, don't ever use NCBI late at night because the Americans are awake. <laughs> That's true. I had an assignment and I was like, okay, procrastinating through the day. And then like 10 o'clock, I went on and like the server was down. Yeah. So I came to speak to my lecturer and he's like, there might be some truth to it. So the next night I tested it again and it happened again. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, the, the East Coast wakes up either six or seven hours after we do. So if you think of noon our time, uh, that's probably about when people on the East Coast are waking up. But America is four time zones wide, so the time we're leaving in the afternoon is about the time that the, that the West Coast is waking up. Uh, and there's a lot of biotech on the West Coast. I mean, you might think it's all Harvard, MIT, blah, blah, blah. It's not. Seattle and San Diego are huge biotechnology hubs, not to mention San Francisco. So. Yes, um, the number of hits on NCBI is going to be very much higher when Americans are awake because there's, uh, they've got a disproportionate number of universities cranking out biologists. Now, good, quite a good point. Okay, so let us move ahead to the next repository. So this one is GenBank, European Nucleotide Archive, and the DNA Data Bank of Japan. All right, I decided to include this one because I thought that it was quite useful to think about um, not just wild type sequences, but to really think about how much variation um, we can observe in the human genome from place to place. Um, you know, many years ago, I was, I was a very young professor at, uh, at uh, Vanderbilt, and a colleague of mine took me aside and said, Dave, you're, you need to understand that the amount of variation that we find in human populations in our research in the United States is minuscule compared to the amount of biological variation you can find in Africa. And I thought to myself, why is he being racist? But this is the reality. Humanity evolved on this continent, and the amount of genetic diversity flowing around in African populations is massive compared to anything you, you would find in the United States. 
So I thought that it would be useful to talk then about genomic variation databases as, as a way to think about this. So the Thousand Genomes Project is designed to sequence a bunch of people. Thousand Genomes is a, a pretty special project from an ethical point of view because they've essentially gotten permission from any participant in the study that anybody can use their data for whatever purposes they deem necessary. That's a, that's a very bad statement of the, the principle, but because these data have been made available with some amount of medical information, you can learn a lot about a lot of different diseases from a genetic point of view in, a, in data that have been um, made publicly available. So this started as a thousand genomes, but it soon became the 10,000 genomes project and now you can just get information about it from the internationalgenome.org. So I, I included this graph from a paper in 2015. This is variant sites per genome, millions. Okay, so we are asking how many, uh, how many detectable variances did we see versus the wild type sequence of humans for each individual. So you can see things like Finn. Anyone know where that is? F-I-N? Finland. Finland. Okay, so Finland has a relatively small amount of genetic variation per person. Um, we have uh, JPT. Anyone know JPT? Japan, Japan Tokyo, I think. I, I forget which, uh, it, it may actually be a specific ethnicity within Japan, but you know, still not, not a hugely greater amount of variation. But what about this one? What about ASW? ASW, where is that one? America. I believe that's a, is that an American, uh, I think that's African American population? When you get to something like uh, uh, YRI, anyone notice that one? It's right here. Anyone know what it stands for? Yoruba. Yoruba. A lot of people from the, uh, from Nigeria, uh, from an ethnic, an ethnic group in Nigeria, uh, have frequently served as a proxy for um, African populations in genomic variation trials. They, they were included in one of the very earliest studies uh, called HapMap uh, on, on this point. But you can see that the amount of variation we have uh, in these populations drawn from um, Africa and the diaspora is much greater. It's something like a 25% increase over what you would find in genetic variation in the rest of the world. Yes? Um, so do you think for the population in this little Indian island that no one really goes to, do you think it would make a huge difference? Sri Lanka? No, <laughs> I don't know the name of the island, it's like... Oh, no oh the, the, the one there. that uh, has the, the fierce xenophobia that will not allow anyone else to land? Yes, yes. Yeah, sure. Do you think there would be like, a lot of variation got in there if somehow we, not captured, but... Someone volunteered. There, you know, so someone the, left the island. So there are, um, there are a lot of determinants to this, but I would say that one of, the, one of the principles that would drive variation down is a founder effect. If you have a very small number of families that move somewhere and they just keep swapping genes with each other, you tend to see a diminution in the vari variation that they have. I remember when I was in high school, um, one, of the, one of the few mentions of South Africa in my genetics textbooks was about the founder effect of having relatively few families that went on track in South Africa, um, leading to uh, red hair becoming very, very common in those populations, and also uh, some, um, I forget what the disease was, a, a blood disease that was associated with the, those, those families. So if you had a relatively small number of families that went to that island, the genetic variation that you, that you find among members of that population would actually be quite low, typically. Um, yeah, I, I, I read a really fascinating article not that long ago about skin color. Um, th there's been a lot of uh, kind of assumption in people from European populations that um, during the Ice Age, uh, humanity developed this mutation that led to pale skin color and that it was, uh, uh, that it, it represented the genesis of white men or something like that. In, in reality, what they found is that all the genetic variants that we find in people like me who have too little melanin um, actually already existed before humanity ever left Africa in the first place. So it, there's, there's a fascinating amount of study uh, in, in this space. Um, 
But, but yes, there, there is certainly a, a solid reason to claim that people of African ancestry show a much greater degree of genetic variability than what you're going to find in Finland to pick a place. Yeah, but so, they would probably have like a certainly some like unique, um, like see, uh, uh, a new yeah. child or something. Like for instance, you have another island I watched a documentary where they can uh, see at night ah. compared to like the rest of us, <laughs> and they don't really move and they don't really have other families except in that particular island, <laughs> and they now can see at night. It's so weird. It, it's also, uh, one, one possible driver for that is that there may be a genetic variant floating around here uh, that would allow people to see particularly well at night, but it's always found as a heterozygote because it, it never gets to pair up with itself. And one of the things that a founder effect can do would mean that you have a greater chance of people being double knockouts, or doesn't have double knockouts, but double, um, a du double alleles for, uh, be homozygous, for that unusual uh, allele. Would that be for the population size? Yeah, sure. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, so I, I'm sorry, I, I can get really excited about this topic. It's really fascinating. I, I also can stumble all over myself trying to describe it sometimes. Uh, but uh, it's, I, you, you will find that a great many grant applications filed from the continent of Africa are going to include language of saying something along the lines of genetic variation in African populations has been chronically understudied, making it harder to determine which findings from the scientific literature are applicable in this genetically different population. So this is, this is a, a common justification for why more genetic research should take place in this continent. Okay, great. So 1,000 genomes, very interesting. You can get reams of data from there. Uh, and a fair amount of information about medical status as well. I haven't run you past time, have I? <laughs> okay, great. I am a big fan of the gene expression omnibus. GEO was uh, in large part designed around microarrays. People were publishing lots and lots of microarray data about the time I was in grad school, actually, in the late 90s, early, uh, early 2000s. Um, and so a lot of people think that if you want microarray data, you would go there, but why would you want microarray data anymore? Surely that's just old passe stuff. But in fact, microarrays are quite useful. But if, as you uh, look across uh, their most recent uh, work, this is still 2013, it's a little out of date perhaps, you see that microarray data are a large part of what you find in that collection, but there's an awful lot of genome binding and occupancy profiling by next-gen sequencing, expression profiling by next-gen sequencing, non-coding RNA profiling by next-generation sequencing, methylation profiling by next-generation sequencing. This is a, data, a, a repository that has very much changed its emphasis so that people who are doing, for example, RNA-seq have, uh, have produced rings of data that are available here. If you have a particular disease of interest in human populations, I urge you to go to the GEO uh, interface and poke it in there, and you can see just how many different studies you can download for free to analyze. A really powerful place. I spend a little bit of time thinking about this in connection with the, um, the gene expression lecture that I give, in, again, in next-gen sequencing. It's not a sequence database, is it? The protein data bank is actually a protein structure database. And you can find things well beyond just protein structures there, too. Understanding uh, how ligands uh, uh, dock with a particular protein is one of the things that you can, you can grab from here. The protein data bank feels small. If we look at this 2014 number, we see that the number of <laughs> different structures in the database was 100,000. 100,000. That seems really small. You know, when you've got gigabases dig, uh, piling up in DNA Data Bank of Japan, etc., it would seem that 100,000 structures is not that big a contribution. But in fact, if you want to understand how sequences form structures that carry on functions, this is really your best bet. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about tomorrow is how we, get a, how we go from a protein structure to a solved structure that ends up in this database and what we can learn from them. So this is very much going to be the emphasis for tomorrow.
but uh, it's a great database. The visualization tools are great. And I gotta say, if you're making a poster for a conference and you're like, I don't think there's anything really picturesque about my research, it's probably very valuable to you to go over to PDB and grab a, a beautiful 3D structure of the protein that you think is so fascinating. It will really spice up that poster. Okay, other things to say here? I thought I saw some questions for me. This is one of the practicals I like to do with the bioinformatics class over at my campus, so it's a fun thing to do. Okay, now I work in proteomics, and proteomics has been kind of the bad boys for a while. We have not been very, and, and yes, too many of us have been boys, that's also the problem. But we have, uh, we have been producing large amounts of proteomic data, but only recently has it come about in our community that trying to publish a proteome without making the raw data available became bad a, a bad practice. People now, I think, are beginning to understand if you are publishing proteomic findings, you must include the raw data along with it. The Proteome Exchange uh, uh, Network uh, cons a Consortium is, uh, is the standard place for uploading your data. Many people say, okay, Pride. Uh, Pride is where you must upload your data, but there are others that you can use as the interface as well. We've got folks like JPost and uh, like in Japan, and uh, we have uh, people like Massive in the United States that make it very easy now for you to upload raw data along with a, a, a proteome that you're publishing. I want to also stand against this idea that repositories are where your data go to die, right? A lot of people say, the journal is making me dump my stuff into a repository. Gosh, that's going to be a time killer. It's going to lose a week of my time. And the internet bills, oh my gosh, it's terrible. But I want to remind you that if your data are put into a repository, it can mean others will benefit from your data. I'm a big proponent of supplementing what you're doing on the bench with data from other experiments that people have made available. If you're doing a gene expression assay on several genes, you can, you can say, gosh, those would be measured on microarrays too. So any data set that uses this particular microarray, I could download and see if they showed comparable results to what I got. Using repositories makes your paper stronger. Okay, so omics DI is one of the pages I would want you to know about for that. Uh, a lot of times the search engines designed for these repositories are really, really bad. But Omics DI has actually done this quite well, that you can go to Omics DI and say, I'm only interested in, say, proteomics experiments, and in this case, I want to get Bacillus uh, lichenoformis. Has anyone here heard of that? It's a very popular critter in certain circles here in the Department of Biotechnology. Well, I thought, gosh, here's this obscure bacteria name. Has anyone ever published a proteome for it? And sure enough, I was able to get back three studies that had analyzed this, this sample in the past. Now, if I were setting up to help, uh, say, Marla do a, a setup for a proteomics experiment in her favorite bacterium, it would be awfully nice if I had previously downloaded these data to figure out what you can see in the thing. Without having paid for doing a new experiment, you already have a notion of what's visible from that species. So, very handy thing to do. Repositories are help here to help us supplement what we can do on the bench. All right, spreadsheets. We don't like spreadsheets that much, not in bioinformatics. They can be very vexing. They can be very limiting. Databases give us a lot more power to, uh, to represent complex data structures and to dig through them very quickly to get back our answers. So I, I want you to free yourself from the mold of thinking, if I can't model it in Excel, it must not be a good model. Excel is good for what it's good for, but that doesn't mean that every study must eventually lead to an Excel spreadsheet. There are a lot of reasons not to go that way. Supporting your experimental data with those that have been previously published to repositories will make your manuscript stronger. This is, this is not a fair reality in a lot of respects, but I want you to know that if you're publishing a data set out of Harvard, or a data set out of University of the Western Cape, reviewers are going to treat your paper at, out of University of Western Cape more harshly. This is, this is the reality of the thing. 
They say, oh, this came from Harvard. I guess it must be good. But if exactly the same, exactly the same data were to be published out of University of the Western Cape, it would not be given the same shake. So one of the ways that you can show, I know what I'm doing, is to show that you can rework existing data and come up with solid results as they were. This helps to establish your credibility as, as a publishing science, as a publishing scientist. I, I know that can be kind of a discouraging thing to hear. That this is the re reality, though, is um, anyone who doesn't work at Harvard doesn't get the Harvard glow on them, right? <laughs> Now there are I'm not saying Harvard is the only place on earth that does good science. I, I would actually say quite the opposite. But I, I, uh, I want you to know that being able to complement the data you produce here with data that are produced elsewhere increases your credibility with peer review. And that is a, it's a, it's a powerful and kind of scary thing to hear. But I think it's, it's quite necessary that you know it.